Salutations! Allow us a quick mention. The sixth chapter in our educational series on evolution of warfare and its technology, War Transformed, is now live. You can check it out on the Graphi app via the link below. This time we cover the period of two world wars and the huge changes those made to warfare in general. Anyway, the SA-2 is perhaps the most famous SAM system in history. The U-2 downing over Soviet Union in 1960 brought it out in the spotlights. And the use in the Vietnam War further cemented its fame. There it downed over 200 US planes. But was it used correctly there? And how effective was it? For a more complete look at SA-2, or S-75 and SA-75, the original Soviet names for its initial variants, we need to go farther back into the past, to the 1950s. There, the Soviet Union was not so much concerned with tactical fighter incursions, but stopping masses of bombers coming into the USSR and dropping atomic bombs. Their earlier system, S-25, was potent but horribly expensive. It was built and deployed only around Moscow. A cheaper and more flexible system was needed. So in 1953, work on S-75 family began. Oh, and this video was scripted and animated by our guest author, Balazs Molnar. Anyway, during the installation of the earlier SAM system, the S-25 Berkut, it became evident that the cost was too high to build it for other cities. Installation of the Berkut system was originally planned for Baku and Leningrad, today's St. Petersburg. For Leningrad, the multi-target channel DAL system with active radar guided missiles was also cancelled due to cost and technical issues. Only the S-75 program remained and got the green light to proceed. The new system was to use 6 cm wavelength microwave technology. The goal was to achieve 29 km of maximum engagement range, with maximum altitude of 20 km. When it became clear that the development of the 6 cm wavelength microwave electronic components could not be finished by the original deadline, a parallel project started, using 10 cm wavelength. This was a quicker solution, because components of the Berkut could be used as base for S-75, as they also used 10 cm wavelength. Using a shorter wavelength with similar aperture size and same output power meant antenna gain could be higher, which produced longer detection ranges. The S-25 Berkut video went more in-depth concerning the basis of radar wavelengths, so check it out. The result of this decision led to two different branches of the 75 design. As a quick interim solution, the SA-75 Dvina used 10 cm wavelength, or 3 GHz, while the other branch, the S-75 Volkov, used 6 cm wavelength, or 5 GHz. The West designated both as the SA-2 guideline, and labeled the two subtypes with an additional letter. The SA-2A Dvina entered service in the USSR in 1957. Export of Dvina started a year later, in 1958. The first deliveries went to China and the Warsaw Pact countries. In 1962, the export to third world countries also began as export to Warsaw Pact ended. A detailed list about exports is in the link in the video description. Most of the exported Dvinas were delivered to Egypt and Vietnam, where they were soon tested in combat. Dvina was the first SAM tested in combat and likely the most launched SAM ever in history. Because of this, Dvina had a strong impact on electronic warfare. Regardless of the glorification and hype around the SA-2 system, surprisingly few manned airplanes were actually downed by it. In Vietnam, some 5200 missiles were launched and only some 205 fighters and attack planes were downed, while the anti-aircraft guns and small arms inflicted some 2140 losses. Why was that? The main reason is that the SA-2 was used against tactical fighters and attack planes, despite the fact this was not considered during its design. Except in Operation Linebacker 2, the SA-2 rarely faced bombers. Even in its debut year in 1965, the engagement success ratio was only 19.4%, while the hit ratio of the missiles was only 11.9%, because generally more than one missile was required to down a target. This quickly fell to 10% and 6% in 1966, and to about 5.5% and 3% in 1967. Those figures remained roughly the same until the end of the conflict. Against BQM-34 recon drones, they were much more successful. 
In its first three years, the kill ratio was between 70 to 85 percent per engagement. The rate then dropped after the Soviet crews left Vietnam. What were the reasons for such a low kill rate of the system? To understand this, we have to be aware of the technical background and the limits of the system. The concept of S-75 was different from the S-25 Berkut. The S-25 required a fixed sight location and launch direction, while the SA-75 was a towed system. It could be relocated following disassembly within a few hours. The Berkut had a large yo-yo radar, which was one of the main reasons it was a fixed SAM sight while the S-75 used different and smaller radars for similar purposes. A single SA-75 battery could launch a missile in any direction, not only in a predefined zone. The scaled-down design approach had a serious impact on the target channels. The S-75 could engage only a single target at a time, as it had one target channel, while a Berkut regiment could engage 20. The SA-75 had a two-stage missile design and could be launched from a rotatable rail. The core of the SA-75 system is the SNR-75 guidance station. This station includes the radar and cabins necessary for guidance and tracking. Initially, the system had five cabins. Later, with the SA-2B variant, it was reduced to three. The main parts of the RSNA-75 radar system are as follows. The PA-11 wide-beam azimuth antenna, PA-12 wide-beam elevation antenna, and P-16 decimeter wavelength missile command transmitter antenna. In azimuth and elevation, the PA-12 and PA-11 antennas scanned in a pattern resembling a cross, within plus or minus 10 degrees, using 2x10 and 10x2 degree wide lobes. The target and the launched missiles had to be in the overlapped 10 by 10 degree zone to measure every parameter. The antenna system of the fire control radar was rotated and tilted up or down to track a single target. The peak impulse power of the radar was 600 kilowatts. The RNSA-75 radar was controlled from the fire control cabin known as the UA cabin. The azimuth distance and azimuth elevation parameters of the track target were displayed by two small cathode ray tube screens in front of the guidance officer in the UA cabin. The tracked target was in the middle of the screen. Target speed, altitude and the flyby distance, which is called distance parameter in Russian, were displayed on three separate analog indicators. In the corner of the UA cabin there was the fire control plot table. This is where the path of the tracked plane was drawn by hand based on the data from fire control radar to judge target position relative to the engagement zone. This helped decide the moment of the missile preparation and launch. The SA-2 family used the same radio command guidance method as the Berkut. The design of the antenna created a major restriction, limiting the ability of the missile to lead the target. Both the target and missiles had to be inside the 10 by 10 degree zone. The P-16 missile command transmitter sent guidance signals to the missiles. A single battery could engage one target with three missiles. This made it harder to defeat the missiles by kinematic turns and provided redundancy in case of a missile failure. Initially only two missile guidance methods were available, but thanks to the experiences of Vietnam, the SA-2 got an additional one. The methods were half-lead, three-point, and half-lead modified by a special constant, also called K-method. Here the minimal altitude of the missile was restricted. Using the half-lead method, the missile is flying half-lead to a pre-calculated impact point with auto or manual target tracking. Half-leading means the missile flies halfway between pure leading method and the current position of the target. In the case of a full leading method, the missile has to perform a higher G-turn against the maneuvering target, even if it is still far from it. The three-point guidance method forces the missile to perform a higher G-turn, compared to half-leading, in the terminal phase. For half-leading, the distance of the target has to be known, it must not be denied by jamming. When automatic target tracking was not possible because of angle, deception jamming or ground clutter, the half-lead method could still be used. The elevation, azimuth angles and distance could be set by hand using the control wheels in the UA cabin. The three-point method was used in case of noise jamming, when the distance of the target was denied, but missile guidance was still possible with manual target tracking. 
it got its name because of the trajectory of the missile, which was always on an imaginary line between the radar and the target. But in case the missile interceptor trajectory was laid out to cross the target trajectory at a steep or near perpendicular angle, the missile still had to perform a terminal phase turn, even if the target did not maneuver at all. The three-point guidance demanded a higher G-turn than the half-lead method. Against the maneuvering target, the chance of a hit was lower because of the limited maneuvering capability of the missile. The point of the automatic mode is that the accuracy of the system is independent from the skill of the crew. Manual target tracking depends on the dexterity of the crew. Using the azimuth data of the bar-like shapes caused by jamming that appeared on the display, the operators in the UA cabin could use small control wheels and set elevation and azimuth for missile guidance. One small control wheel was available for azimuth, elevation and setting the distance. Optical target tracking was also an option measuring azimuth and elevation for three-point method. This was for the worst-case scenarios, where the jamming was so powerful that every method of electronic tracking was made useless. The third leading method is a special version of the first. In Vietnam, the US pilots figured out Vina's weak spot. Following a missile launch, if they performed a quick high-speed dive, Dvina's control system simply guided the missile into the ground. The guidance control calculated the interception point by using measured target parameters, speed and direction, regardless of the fact that it was below ground level. Using this mode in elevation, the guidance is corrected with a K constant parameter to avoid ground collision. The leading type could be set in flight or before the launch, but changing the leading method during flight could decrease the chance of a hit. During the Vietnam War, Export of the more modern SAM systems, such as S-75M Volkov and S-125M Neva to Vietnam, was denied because of transport issues. The US sea mine operations made the naval ports of North Vietnam inaccessible. The Soviets did not want to risk their newest and best SAM systems accidentally falling into Chinese hands during railway transport. Therefore, an upgrade program was initiated for Dvina from 1969 which led to the SA-2F variant. A part of the upgrade package was optical tracking capability. Dvina got the so-called doghouse cabin above the PA-11 antenna, with two operators. They tracked the target manually using fixed binoculars and control wheels, one for each axis. The control wheels were coupled electrically with the wheels inside the UA cabin. By translating the position of the wheels, the system accepted this as azimuth and elevation input. In worst-case scenarios, the RSNA-75 could be used for target acquisition alone, but that was a very suboptimal method. Given the scanning was displayed in the UA cabin, it was impossible to draw plots for multiple targets. Because of that, from 1962 onward, every battery got the P-12 radar for long-range target acquisition. The P-12 used meter wavelengths, or 150 megahertz and the nominal detection range against fighter-sized planes was about 180 kilometers, or 110 miles, at high level. The rotation speed of the radar was 6 rounds per minute. The detected targets were displayed on a remote round shape indicator, or PPI scope, next to the battery commander in the UA cabin. Between two scans, the target markings glowed on the scope, which made it possible to judge the speed and path of the targets. The P-12 radar could not measure target altitude, and its ranging accuracy could miss by a kilometer, but it provided adequate situational awareness to make decisions. It was the primary tool in deciding the initiation of an engagement. At the rear of the UA cabin was a large plot table, where the plot crew manually drew target paths using crayons on a glass plate. The coordinates were forwarded via radio from a higher level command post. This method of target acquisition could have one to two minute delay time. This could be used only against subsonic targets. The advantage of this method was that the location of the SA-75 battery could be hidden as not even the P-12 radar had to be turned on. The last option for getting coordinates was by data link from integrated air defense systems from a higher level command post. The RSNA-75 was turned to direction of the target using forwarded coordinates. The crew performed their actions following commands issued by light indicators. A panel with indicators showed when they should turn on the radar, start preparing the missiles, etc. 
Besides the RSNA75 and P12 radars, the battery could have the PRV11 height finding radar, but this was not very typical. The battery was operational even without the height finder radar. The PRV11 did not scan in 360 degrees around it. It measured altitude only in a designated direction. In practice, azimuth data from the P12 radar was enough to direct the radar from the guidance station, then have it do a quick scan in elevation, up and down, to find the target. Dvina used a two-stage missile. The missile had a booster and a traveling stage. Because of this, the launch weight was only half of Berkut's weight. The first stage used solid fuel, and the second used liquid fuel. A liquid fuel was the same as Berkut's. The rocket engine produced a strong smoke trail, which was visible from more than 20 kilometers away. This made it possible for tactical fighters and attack planes to perform evasive maneuvers at the right moment, to successfully dodge the missile. The 900 kg or 2000 pound booster stage burned out after 3 seconds, while it accelerated the missile to 550 meters per second, or Mach 1.6. During the boost stage, the missile could not perform turns. The separation of the booster ignited the second stage, that enabled the missile to perform turns. For the V750D1 type missile, the engine provided 26 kN of thrust and achieved the 20 km maximum engagement altitude. The U2 overflights proved this maximum altitude to be inadequate. This led to the V750V11D type missile with a stronger 31 kN thrust capable engine, which provided a maximum engagement altitude of 27 km. The launch weight of the three different types of missiles was around 2.4 tons. The warhead weight was 196 kilograms, or 432 pounds, and it contained 8200 chunks of shrapnel. From the second half of the 60s, gyroscope spin-up time in the missiles was reduced from 2 minutes to 30 seconds, but the time to keep gyroscope spinning without overheating was decreased from 25 to just 5 minutes. This exchange provided better reaction time to the system, but it was not without a disadvantage. The missile were stored on launch rails, which could be rotated in any direction. The elevation of the launch could also be set. Regardless of the booster stage, the launcher and the very quick initial acceleration provided a better minimal engagement range and made it possible to engage receding targets. A typical engagement was conducted by following these steps. Target acquisition using the P-12 radar or external source, if without radar. Preparation of two or three missiles based on the acquired data. Turning on the fire control radar for target tracking. If target parameters were not within missile launch envelope, the missiles were set back to storage state. Launch of the missiles, evaluation of the guidance and hits, and more launches again if needed. End of engagement and turning off the radar. The combination of the missile type and guidance station defined the engagement zone. The early SA-75, or SA-2A, with the first missile had maximum engagement altitude of only 20 km, and maximum target speed was 420 m per second. The minimal engagement altitude was 3 km, and the minimal engagement distance was 5 km. The maximum engagement distance was 30 km. With the V750V11D, the maximum engagement range increased to 35 km, while the altitude increased to 27 km. The SA-75M and MK, or SA-2B variant, had the same engagement zone against subsonic targets as the S-75, but the maximum target speed was slightly increased, to 520 m per second. Finally, with the SA-2F and the V750VMV11DMU missile, the maximum target speed reached 1000 m per second. The minimal engagement distance above target speed of 420 m per second was 12 km. As target speed increases, the engagement zone decreases. Against a target doing 1000 m per second, the minimal altitude is 10 km, and the minimal range is 16 km. Every presented zone was based against non-jamming targets, using the half-leading method. The SA-75 could fire at receding targets, but the engagement zone was different depending on speed and other parameters. The turning capability of the missile below 10 km was less than 7 Gs. 
at 20 km it was only 4G, and at 27 km only 2.5G turns were possible, which limited its maximum engagement altitude. The SA-75 batteries in peacetime were typically deployed in Warsaw Pact countries in static SAM sites, but they could be deployed to any field with road access during wartime. It would be an overstatement calling Dvina mobile. The nominal relocation time of the Dvina was about 2 hours. The self-propelled SAMs were far more mobile because of their design. For example, the readiness time of the 2K12 Kub or SA-6 from stop to launch capability was about 5 minutes. Dvina sites were not hardened, but only protected ramparts built around vans, cabins and missile rails. The deployment layout was hexagonal. In the middle there was the fire control and other cabins. The P-12 target acquisition and the PRV-11 height finder radars were outside the hexagon all around the site. One battery had six single rail launch stations. Six more additional missiles were on missile transporters and a loader vehicle. The missile reloading required three to four minutes. The rotatable fire control radar of the missile launchers provided a flexible engagement zone. The Dvina batteries could produce quite a dense target channel distribution, even though their batteries had only a single target channel. In a ring deployment about 35 kilometers away from a larger city, about 20 Dvina batteries could provide about 3 or 4 overlapping engagement zones, if that was needed. Remember, a single Berkut regiment had 20 target channels. The presence of the Dvina alone forced big changes in tactics and equipment. Because of the minimal engagement altitude of the system, the planes started to fly lower, but this increased the chance of being shot down by AAA guns. Many times a missile launch was enough to make the attacked plane jettison its bombs to attain better maneuverability. Therefore the intended target was protected, even though the plane was not downed. As the conflict advanced, the tactical fighters got radar warning receivers and jamming equipment. They were not simply outmaneuvering the missiles. The US Air Force Tactical Air Command, or TAC, and bombers of the Strategic Air Command, SAC, used noise jamming. A noise jamming by an individual plane caused only a single bar on the screen in the UA cabin, but certain formations could produce so many jamming bars that even manual tracking became impossible. In 1966, the CIA bought an SA-75 MK or SA-2B complex from Indonesia, which made it possible to develop modulated noise jamming. A single jamming plane could now produce more than one bar on the view screen, and planes in formation could totally fill the screen with jamming bars. In this case only optical guidance was possible at daytime and this meant shorter range for visual tracking. The US Navy planes performed angle deception jamming by using the NA ALQ-51 system. This sent a deception impulse to the fire control radar side lobes, which created a mustache shape on the target reflection. The displayed center of the target was off from the actual one, which meant the missile missed the target if automatic target tracking was used. This forced the system to use manual target tracking, setting angles and distance by hand. The human eyes and brain were the anti-jamming tool. The effectiveness of jamming is very apparent if you compare the percentage of manual tracking over the years. In 1965, only 29% of the engagements were performed by manual tracking. This was increased to 90% by early 1967 and peaked at 96% in late 1967. The TAC also had another electronic warfare method in 1967, where they successfully jammed the radio command guidance signals of the missiles. With this type of jamming, the missiles simply crashed because of the lack of connection with the guidance station. If that kind of jamming was detected, launch was forbidden. A field upgrade that quadrupled the power of the RCG antenna negated the effect of this jamming, but the rivalry and lack of proper communication between TAC and SAC led to a peculiar situation during the Operation Linebacker 2. The B-52s still tried to jam the radio communication of the missiles, while the TAC knew that did not work since 1969. During Vietnam, first standoff jamming planes also appeared, which could jam the P-12 radars. This made the target acquisition, target selection and general decision-making much harder. If the jamming planes were close enough and numerous enough, 
the jamming could completely block the P-12. The first anti-radiation missile, the AGM-45 Shrike, also appeared in Vietnam with limited capabilities. It had a short range of about 20 to 30 kilometers at low to medium altitude. The AGM-45 carrier aircraft had to fly inside of at least one main lobe of the SAM fire control radar. The launch of the AGM-45 anti-radiation missile was visible when it separated from the tracked target on the screens in the UA cabin. For a moment, two targets were visible on indicators in wide B mode. Thanks to this, a counter-tactic was developed. During missile guidance, the radar was turned off for short intervals. If the fire control radar was turned off, the missile missed the target even if it was close to it at that moment, about 8 to 10 kilometers. While the AGM-45 was primitive, it was also dirt cheap. About 10,000 were launched during the whole conflict. The AGM-45 was a tool of suppression rather than destruction. The US forces tried many different tactics to destroy SAM sites, not only with AGM-45, but dump bombs and rockets. During Linebacker 2, carpet bombings were also used. The SAM sites were heavily camouflaged, and many decoy sites were set up which were also defended by anti-aircraft artillery. From 1965 to 1967, about 24% of wild weasel attacks hit only these dummy sites. 20% hit empty sites and some 56% hit a real battery. When the attack did hit a real target, only 45% of the cases featured any shrapnel damage on any cabin. About 8-19% to of the damage caused the loss of a cabin. The fire control radar received even fewer hits. In total, about 2-5% to of attacks resulted in at least one cabin loss. The total equipment loss during the Vietnam War was about 38 Dvina complexes. The most well-known occasion when the SA-2 faced the targets it was designed to destroy happened during the Operation Linebacker 2 at the end of 1972. The main targets were in Hanoi and Haiphong. The operation lasted for 11 days. Besides the SAM protected cities, the undefended cities of Ladang and Tai Nguyen were also targets. The air defense successfully engaged the B-52 bombers many times, regardless of the ample support that would otherwise be impossible to attain attacking an opponent like the USSR. On some days, more than a hundred support planes escorted the bombers. The inflicted losses on the first and third days were very serious. On the first day, three B-52s were downed and four damaged, and on the third day, six bombers were downed. Only four to six Dvina batteries were active then. Following the large losses of the third day, the tactic of using three separate attack waves was changed and only a single wave was used. Because of the length of operation, the air defense started to run out of missiles, suffered losses and its effectiveness decreased. Considering the large waves, the losses were not high proportionally, but considering the low number of available active SAM batteries and the support, the result of the engagements was pretty successful. The planned operational environment of the B-52 was to attack the Soviet Union without any support planes. There, the fighters of the Soviet homeland air defense would be a threat as well. If we imagine smaller waves, only about a dozen B-52s without any support, it might have been that only a fraction of the bombers, if any, would have ever reached the target. The SA-2 was effective against the targets it was designed to deal with. In short, the experiences of Vietnam paved the future of electronic warfare and SAM development. The good old race between the sword and the shield continued in a different form.